See, God created you. He made you with a plan and purpose. And because of that, we're always hungry, looking for a purpose and meaning. But here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you. If you don't find God's purpose for your life, you'll search for it in the wrong places. And that's what happened to Samson. As we pick up his story, we see Samson has grown into a man. He's supernaturally strong as God raised him to be, to lead God's people. But unfortunately, Samson loses sight of his purpose. Rather than following God, he starts to seek for meaning in life by pursuing worldly pleasures. And the sad truth we find is this. Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. It was a beautiful sunny day in Florida, USA on April 11th, 1970 as the spacecraft named Apollo 13 blasted into the sky on its way to the moon. Apollo 13 was the third spaceship sent to the moon and the three astronauts on board were eagerly looking forward to making history as they walked on the surface of the moon. The spaceship was the most powerful and advanced vessel ever to go into space. The blast-off was a brilliant display of power as the engines thrust the vessel high into the sky. The crowd cheered and everything seemed perfect on the outside. But unknown to the astronauts and the controllers back on the ground, things were not perfect. During takeoff, one of the engines shut down two minutes early due to dangerous and unseen vibrations. Then, when the spaceship was 200,000 miles from Earth, disaster struck. Small wires that controlled cooling fans began to short circuit. The surrounding insulation caught fire. The fire spread to an oxygen tank and caused an explosion. Without warning, there was a loud bang, and the electricity in Apollo 13 was cut off. Apollo 13 was in serious danger, 200,000 miles from home, with no way to repair the damage, nowhere to land. The lives of the three astronauts were hanging in the balance. The controllers back at headquarters quickly began to abandon their plans to go to the moon and tried desperately to save the lives of the three astronauts. There's a powerful lesson for all of us in the true story of Apollo 13 and the disaster that struck the spaceship after takeoff. To those watching the liftoff that day, everything seemed perfect. The astronauts inside were unaware of the danger. The controllers and engineers at space headquarters had no idea there was trouble. No one knew that small wires would fray and burn, leading to one of the most serious accidents in space travel. The secret flaw was hidden from view, but eventually the weakness was revealed and the whole world saw the problem that was hidden inside. In the same way today, we are often deceived by outward appearances. Things look good outwardly when all of a sudden a problem explodes. It seems as if it came from nowhere, but in actual fact, that secret flaw had been burning for some time. A business seems to be prospering. Clients are signing contracts every day and the company expands into new markets when all of a sudden everything comes crashing down. A church seems to be growing and blessed when suddenly a disagreement breaks out into the open and the church splinters into pieces. A marriage seems perfect on the outside, but before you know it, the couple has divorced. A Sunday school teacher appears to be the perfect Christian, but one day she drops out of church and never comes back when she turns her back on God. For the fact is, appearances can be deceiving. What looks strong can often be flawed internally. What looks successful is actually about to fall apart. What seems so sincere hides a hypocrisy deep within. See, friends, we must remember something. It's the hidden flaws that are the most dangerous and the most deadly. Certainly, that was true 
of the man named Samson. In the history of the world, he's perhaps the greatest example of someone who seems so strong, so successful, so sure of himself, yet in one day, in one moment of weakness, his entire life crumbled. How did it happen? Are there any lessons we can learn from it? Did he really just fall overnight? Or was the destruction hidden so deep, no one noticed until it was too late? All these questions and more will be answered in the next few weeks as we start our new sermon series titled, Samson, A Story of Failure and Redemption. We're going to discover the secret hidden flaws inside this famous man that was known for his strength and suddenly for his weakness. But not only that, we're going to discover something else, the secrets that can help weak men become strong. Almighty and everlasting Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We confess that we are weak. We confess that without you we have nothing. We confess that we need you today. I need you to help me preach. We need you to help us to learn and listen to the truth. And so we surrender to you. We submit ourselves to you. We bind every voice of the devil that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I lose the power of the Holy Spirit to come and enlighten our hearts and minds. Teach us what makes strong men weak. Teach us what makes weak men strong. Teach us today, Lord, so that we can follow your plan and purpose in our lives and accomplish what you've sent us to do. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. I invite you to take a moment, join your faith with mine today. Put your hand on your chest and pray after me, Lord Jesus. Speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here with me today as we begin a new sermon series titled Samson, A Story of Failure and Redemption. I'm excited because I believe we are all going to learn so much from the life of Samson. We're going to discover truths that that will change us and help us to avoid the problems that Samson faced. Now, you may be wondering, why Samson? Why study this man? After all, what is is there in the story of Samson that can help me today? You may be thinking of only the few facts you know about him. You knew that he was strong, you knew that he never went to a barber, and you knew that he messed up with a lady named Delilah. Yet those facts may not seem to relate to you. But the truth is, many of us know some things about Samson, but not many of us know the details of his story. But when we look in the Bible and discover the details of his story, we find out there's more to him than strong arms, long hair, and uncontrolled lust. His story is more than one of strength and weakness. If it were not that, we wouldn't have much to learn. But because he has a story that is greater than that, it can speak to all of us because it's a story of failure and redemption. It's a story of missing God's plan, but finding your way back to succeed with your purpose and potential. And that's a story we can all relate to. You see, whether you know it or not, you have a lot in common with Samson. You are a person that God has chosen. You have a divine destiny. But that destiny can only be fulfilled when you follow the right path. You must not seek strength in and of yourself, in your own ability or wisdom or power or talent, but you must rather depend upon God. So let's begin today by taking out our sermon notes and discovering three lessons from the life of Samson. And here's your first truth today. God is always looking for a man he can use. Hear the word of the Lord to you today in Ezekiel 22:30. God says, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. 
And I'm here to tell you today that God is always looking for a man. He's always looking for someone he can use. God wants to do great things. He wants to save and heal and deliver. He wants to rescue our nation. There is no unwillingness with God. But the problem is God wants to work through man. And as he searches for men and women who will yield themselves to him, he often finds no one. He wants to raise up men and women who can attain spiritual greatness so that he can use them. Yet much of the time, God finds no one available. And God is saying the same thing today. He's looking for men of integrity. He's looking for women of integrity. He's looking for men who will stand up for those who cannot stand for themselves. He's looking for men who will have courage, uh, men who will lay down their lives, who will be an example of sacrifice to the next generation. God is looking for men and women who will be on fire for Jesus. Somebody say amen. And this is actually where Samson's story begins. The Bible tells us in Judges 13.1 that the people of God had backslidden. They turned away from God and the Lord sent their enemies to punish them. But in the midst of their pain, God's people cried out to him, deliver us, O Lord. And God's answer was to send them a man. So before we talk about Samson's long hair, before we talk about his big biceps or his disappearance, integrity with Delilah, we've got to stop and look at the fact that God called Samson. Samson was God's man. Samson was anointed. Samson had the vision of God. Samson had the purpose of God. His story actually begins when an angel came from heaven and appeared to his father and mother and promised them a son who would deliver Israel. Before he was conceived, before his mother and father met to conceive him, an angel came and said, you will have a son who will deliver my people. So Samson's story is that his birth was divinely foretold. It was miraculously performed and uniquely appointed for God's purposes. God knew Samson would be born even before the time he was conceived. God gave him life. God gave him destiny. And God gave him purpose. And you may be sitting here today and say, well, how does that relate to me? After all, your birth may not have been miraculous. No angel appeared to tell your mother she would conceive you. In fact, you may be even wondering if God has a plan or purpose in your life at all. But friends, listen to me. You are no different than Samson. God knew Samson would be born and God knew that you would be born. God gave Samson life and it's God who gave you life. God placed his hand on Samson with a divine calling and purpose and God has placed his hand upon you for a divine calling and purpose. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 4a, the Lord has made everything everything for his own purpose. And I came to declare to you today, you were made for God's purpose and you can only find your purpose in God. For Colossians 1.16 says everything, absolutely everything, somebody say everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. So put your hand on your chest and say after me, I got started in God. I have a purpose in God. See, God was looking for a man to deliver his people when he raised up Samson. And God is still looking for men and women he can call upon to raise them up and deliver his people. And that's why I'm here to tell you God knew you before you were born. He called you forth to live in this generation. He brought you to live in the family you're in, in the nation you're in, in the generation you're in. Whether an angel proclaimed it or not, the word of God proclaims it. God ordained you. You've been chosen. For no man comes to this life without God's direct intervention. For the Bible says in Acts 17, 28, it is in him that we live and move and keep on living. So you're here by God's purpose and plan. You're not an accident. You were created and planned by God. And whether you know it or not, God's hand has been upon you since you were born. Some years ago, a farmer up in Wingkongo near Bolgatanga in the Upper East region of Ghana lost his dog. Now, the farmer needed his dog, and the dog was nowhere to be found. So the farmer set off with some of his friends to search for the dog. They searched for hours, and they eventually found the dog the next day sleeping on the ground under a bridge. 
But to their surprise, the dog was not alone. The dog was lying next to a tiny newborn baby boy. Someone had abandoned their baby boy and left the child under the bridge in the middle of nowhere. The child was in danger. He could have been killed by wild animals or died from exposure. But when the dog found the child, the dog laid down and kept the child safe overnight. When I heard that true story, I was amazed. I said, wow, God must have a plan for that baby. There must be something about that child. God rescued him. God sent a dog. When his mother and father abandoned him, God sent a dog to protect him. That must have been God. But then the Lord spoke to me, and he said, tell my people that my hand is upon them just as it was on that newborn baby boy in Upper East. I've been keeping them when they didn't know it. I've been protecting them from unseen harm and danger. How many times have I sent my guardian angels to protect and keep them and watch over them in the night? And I'm here to tell you today, God has his hand upon your life. He's had his hand upon you since you were born. He's delivered you and rescued you when you didn't even know the danger was all around you. He's kept you safe and you didn't even know it. When you were a little baby being born, he kept you from dying. There was a complication no one saw. God came and intervened. As you lay there in the maternity ward, an evil woman had the plan to snatch you and take you into bondage, but God thwarted that evil plan and covered you. How many times were you exposed to malaria, but God covered you and healed you and brought you back? How many times have you sat in a trotro or a taxi or an airplane when an accident was about to happen and suddenly heaven opened and an angel came down and put his guardian angel around you and protected you and kept you safe. God has been watching over you. He knows when you lie down and when you get up. He knows what you eat and what you didn't eat. He knows all the trouble and sorrows and he has seen you through. He's watched over you to guard you and protect you because he has a plan for your life. And though the path may be long and the road may be rough, though the winds may be strong and the storm may be tough, though the night may be dark and the valley may be deep, the Lord is your shepherd. He's seen you through, and you're here today because God is watching over you. And God has kept you for his purpose. See, God never wastes anything. He never makes a mistake. He never creates something without a purpose. And if you're still here on earth, you still have a purpose from God. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians 1.4. Long before he laid down earth's foundation, before he created the heaven, the sun, and the moon, he had us in mind, hey, and settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Before he created the angels, before he did any other thing, God had you in mind. He had a purpose and a plan for you. And I believe that when your life belongs to God, then everything is going to work out all right in the end. If things have not yet worked out all right, then this is not the end. Somebody say amen. Because when your life belongs to God, he's working behind the scenes to bring it all to a good end. And if things are not there yet, don't worry. Don't get discouraged. This is not the end. There's still another day of God to redeem in your life. There's still another work of God to do in you. There's still a purpose for God to fulfill in you. So I call forth the purposes of God in your life today. I call forth the leaders in government and commerce that God is raising in this house. I call forth the leaders in health care and justice and education and the arts. I call forth the innovators in education and counseling and psychology. I call forth the innovators in science and technology. I call forth the prophets and the pastors and teachers and evangelists and apostles that are here today. I declare God's 
purpose over you in this generation. Somebody say amen. Because God is raising up men and women who represent Jesus in every sector of society. God is always looking for a man. And you can be that man. You can be that woman. You can be the one who achieves God's purpose in your generation. For Samson's story is the story of a man plucked from nowhere to deliver an entire nation. He was not a pastor. He was not a prophet. He was a judge, a ruler, a man with a destiny. And you are too. You are a man and a woman of destiny. Sadly, most people go through life unaware of their purpose. We seem to be searching for meaning in life. And the sad news is when we don't find our meaning in God, then we start to look for it in other places. See, the fact is you were created to live for God's purpose. God made you that way. You're wired with the DNA to live for something. And that's our second truth from Samson's story. Number two, man is always looking for a purpose he can fulfill. See, God created you. He made you with a plan and purpose. And because of that, we're we're always hungry, looking for a purpose and meaning. But here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you. If you don't find God's purpose for your life, you'll search for it in the wrong places. And that's what happened to Samson. As we pick up his story, we see Samson has grown into a man. He's supernaturally strong as God raised him to be to lead God's people. But unfortunately, Samson loses sight of his purpose. Rather than following God, he starts to seek for meaning in life by pursuing worldly pleasures. And the sad truth we find is this. Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. He had all the muscles any man could ever want, but he lacked the inner strength to use them for God's glory. He had all the power and leadership and success he could want, yet his hidden inner flaws knocked him off course and caused him to crash. What were the hidden flaws inside Samson? There were three things that made this strong man weak. First was lust. Samson said, I want it. I've got a habit. I'm going to get it. And in his pursuit of lust, he forgets all logic. Uh, he loses sight of reason. Listen to Judges 14, 1 and 2. He says, Samson demanded, get her for me. And it wasn't just Delilah. Did you know that Samson had other girlfriends, other prostitutes, other Philistine women he met with? God had forbidden him to marry a woman from outside God's people. Yet that's exactly where Samson went. He left his hometown and traveled four miles to the town of his enemies to find a woman. He saw a hot lady and he wanted her and lust turned inside of him and destroyed him because lust makes a strong man weak. Samson could kill a lion, but he couldn't control his passion. He defeated thousands of the enemies, but he couldn't defeat the enemy within. And lust will destroy you too if you allow it to burn in your life. It may be hidden from view. No one may know it's there, but that fatal flaw can drive you down and destroy your life and the lives of those around you. But lust wasn't the only hidden flaw in Samson. The second thing that made this strong man weak was that he was full of anger. He said, I deserve it. Listen to Judges 14.9. It tells us that Samson was burning with anger. And anger is often our automatic reaction to events. It's often the negative default emotion. When something goes wrong, we get angry. We stub our toe on the chair, and then we kick the chair and curse the chair. Hey! One time, I confess, I was driving, and I got behind a very slow-moving car. I'm like, what is the problem with it? This is not a car park. It's a motorway. Let's go. Let's go. I couldn't believe how slow this car was driving. And the other cars were passing in the other lane. I couldn't have a chance to pass this slow car. But finally, the road next to me cleared. I pulled out. I passed that car. I turned and looked at that man. What are you doing? And I drove past him and pulled in front of him. <laughs> I was moving. I was in charge. I was in control. I was a winner. But up ahead, 
I came to a traffic light. It was red. When I stopped, I waited at the light. To my shock and surprise, who drove up next to me? That slow car. I looked at him and said, hey, I thought I left you behind. Never mind. When the light turned green, I put on the pedal to the metal. I went down deep and I went fast. I passed that slow car and I kept going. Hey, I'm a winner. Oh, I came to another red light. When I stopped, I waited. I looked over and to my shock, the slow car came and pulled up next to me. Hey. Finally, I was about to my destination. I was going to a crow mall. I was about to pull in. I was about to get in when something hindered me and slowed me. And to my shock and surprise, the slow car passed me in the crow mall parking lot and parked in the spot where I wanted. Hey. Because you can try with your own effort. You can get angry. You can get furious. You can demand your way. But only God can determine your path. And anger makes strong men weak. Samson had lust. Samson had anger. And Samson had pride. He said to himself, I can do it. I'm a mighty man. Did you see my biceps? Did you see my thighs? I'm the strongest man alive. In Judges 15, 15, we read, Then Samson said, With a donkey's jawbone, I, somebody say I, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I, 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 Samson, have killed a thousand men. Hey, did you hear what Samson said? I did it. I'm the one. I'm the man. Macho. He boasted in his own accomplishment. But let's be frank. No matter what, no matter how strong, no human being can kill a thousand men with a donkey's jawbone unless the supernatural power of God is with you. Samson said, I, 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 yet that pride bound him and trapped him. And before he knew what happened, he was in trouble. He lost sight of his destiny and left the path set for him. And the same thing will happen to us. For when you have pride in your life, it's a place where the devil can come in and catch you. Thousands of years ago, there was a very famous sculptor named Gorlal. Gorlal was the most famous sculptor in the whole world. His statues were so perfect, you could not tell the difference between the statue created by Gorlal and the real human being. His statues looked like real people. So one day, Gorlal slept and had a dream. And in the dream, he was shown that after 15 days, the demon of death would come and take him away. Gorlal was panicked when he woke up. He didn't know what to do. He had 15 days and the demon of death was coming for him. So he decided he would have to come up with a plan to trick the demon of death. He quickly prepared nine statues of himself, identical statues. They were so perfect that when you looked at the statue and you looked at Gorlal, you couldn't tell which was real and which was the statue. And on the 15th day. He finished the last statue. He arranged the nine statues in the hall and then he stood frozen just like the other statues. Sure enough the demon of death came into the room but the demon of death was confused. He saw ten images. Nine were statues. One was the real Gorlal but he couldn't tell which was which. So the demon of death rushed back to Satan and said I can't no, which one is Gorlal? Who do I take? Satan was very angry, and he came to see for himself. At first he was perplexed, but then he thought about it for a moment. He knew Gorlal. He knew he was a man of pride. And so the Satan said this, Gorlal, these sculptures would have been perfect, except for one mistake. When Gorlal heard the devil tell him, that there was a mistake in his statues. Rage began to burn inside of him. How dare he insult me? I'm the great Gorlal, the great sculptor. I'm the one who can do anything. And the anger became so great and the pride became so great. Gorlal jumped down and said, what? Where is the mistake? Where is the fault? And the devil said, is there inside of you? It's called pride. And the devil captured him and carried him away. Gorlal had faultless statues, but he was caught because of pride. Pride, anger, lust, hidden flaws no one sees, sins kept in secret, attitudes that make the strong man weak. See, friends, here's the truth you need to know today. A strong man becomes weak 
when he's driven by his emotions rather than led by the Spirit. For no matter how strong you are, no matter how talented, how beautiful, how successful, how educated, how accomplished, how applauded by men, you are weak when you allow your emotions to dictate your decisions rather than the Spirit of God. We have so much potential. Every one of you listening and watching, you have potential, yet we go astray and miss the path by seeking our purpose and meaning in other things. And the strength God has given to us becomes weakness when we allow our emotions to lead us astray. Friends, do not be deceived. True strength doesn't come through your great accomplishments. True strength doesn't come through the things that you've done. True strength doesn't come from your education or your financial level or your beauty. It comes through the inner strength of character developed in dependence on God. And maybe you're here today and you're accomplished. You have a degree from Oxford. Oxford, A. You own a house at a Jingano. A Jingano. Hey! You drive a Benz car. A Benz. Your nail polish matches your blush. Your blush matches your earring. Your earring matches your belt. Your belt matches your handbag. Your hand matches your shoe. You are so beautiful, successful, handsome but you're sidetracked by every little thing that comes along. The smallest thing can make you angry. You're so full of pride, you can't even appreciate that without God you are nothing. And the hidden flaws are eating away inside of you, destroying the strength you should have. And strong men become weak when we allow these emotions to control them. Let me tell you the truth. Without Jesus Christ, I am nothing. Without Jesus Christ, I can do nothing. Without Jesus Christ, I can help no one. Without Jesus Christ, my strength, my anointing, my ability, my talent means nothing. And if we really saw ourselves as God sees us, that we are utterly dependent upon him, we would fall on our faces and cry out for mercy. God forbid that we start boasting in our anointing. God forbid that we start boasting in our ability or our accomplishment. You know, God has done great things for us, but God forbid that we should start to think it was my good goodness or my ability or my anointing for without him we are nothing if not for God where would we be the only good in us is Jesus and Samson lost his way and the strong man became weak because lust and anger and pride took over in his life but we can learn from his story and we can write a different story. I want my story to read like this. I will not find the purpose of my life in my flesh. I will be led by the Holy Spirit and find my purpose in life in God. That's why 2 Timothy 2, 19 to 22 says, if you keep yourself pure, somebody say pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean. Somebody say clean. And you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. The Bible doesn't say you will be a special utensil for honorable use if you prophesy. It does not say that. It does not say you will be honorable and special in your purpose if you have gifts and talents, if you preach and people get saved. It says you are a special vessel of the Lord and you will be used in great ways when you keep yourself pure. I don't care who you are today. If you are pure, God is going to raise you up. If you're living righteous, God is going to raise you up. If you're led by the Spirit, God is going to bring you into greatness in your life. But if you are emotion-driven and not Spirit-led, then no matter how talented, no matter how you prophesy, no matter how you sing, no matter what you do, your abilities won't survive. For God's goal is that we find our strength in him. That's why 1 John 2.14 says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you've overcome the evil one. And our power comes not by trusting in ourselves and our own strength, but by trusting in God. For Galatians 5, 16 to 17 says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to our sinful nature. And that brings us to our third lesson from Samson's life. Purpose is always fulfilled when man submits 
to God. So here's the good news for all of us today. God is our redeemer. He can redeem any weakness and turn it into strength. He's always calling us to greater things. He never loses sight of the power and the purpose and the calling on our lives. Even when we go astray, even if we get tripped up by lust or anger or pride, God is always seeking to bring us back to his purpose. He continues to call us back and he sets up situations to remind us of our need for him. And that's what happened to Samson. When the strong man became weak because of lust and anger and pride, God set up a situation that made Samson come back to God. In Judges 15, 18 to 20, the Bible says Samson won a great victory. He killed a lot of people and he won a great battle. Listen to what the Bible says. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. So the spring was called an Hakor, and it is still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of of the Philistines. So understand what happened. Samson was full of pride, full of lust, full of anger. He went out and because God's calling was upon him, he defeated the enemy. But then he became lifted up with pride. He said, I have done it. I have conquered. I've won the victory. And God said, I will show you who's in control. And suddenly Samson became thirsty. He'd been out in the sun. He'd been battling. He'd been sweating. He'd been killing Philistines. And he became so thirsty he thought he would die. He looked for a well. There was none. He looked for a faucet. There was none. He looked for a tap. There was none. And suddenly he realized he was alone and utterly dependent upon God for no matter how strong he was, no matter how able he was, he could not produce water from nothing. So in his desperation he cried out to God, Oh God, give me water. Oh God, don't let me die. He turned back to acknowledge that God is there for him in the hour of need. Somebody say amen. And in his story, we can discover three things that every one of us can use uh, to make strength out of weakness. First of all, it was a desire for God. The Bible says in verse 18, he cried out to God. Then second, he gave glory to God. And he said in verse 18, you have given your servant this great victory. Before he was boasting, I, I, I. But now he says, it is you, O Lord. And he humbled himself before God. In verse 18 and verse 19, the Bible says, the spring was called an hakor, meaning caller spring. You see, when Samson desired God and gave glory to God and humbled himself before God, then he fulfilled his purpose in life. The Bible says Samson judged Israel for 20 years. Samson reclaimed his purpose. Samson found his identity when he submitted to God. When he trusted in himself in his own power, he had named the place Ramath Lehi, the place where the jawbone was lifted up. But when he submitted to God, Samson renamed the place and Hakor, Collar's Spring. The name was changed to one that exalted Samson and changed to a name that exalted God. And the result was he led Israel for 20 years, 20 years of peace, 20 years of prosperity. Before Samson failed with Delilah, he fulfilled his destiny. Before he lost his hair, he won with God. Before his sight was stolen, he saw his purpose. He submitted to God and gave him the glory. And the same thing is true for all of us. If you let your needs drive you to God, God will meet your deepest needs. Don't let your life be known by what you can do. Let your life be known by what God can do. Don't name your accomplishments after yourself. Acknowledge God and depend on him. I never want to be known as a great man of God. I want to be known as a man in whom God is great. The focus is not on me. It's on Jesus. And that's what God is looking for from you today. God has a plan for you. 
He has a destiny for you. He has a purpose. So don't waste your potential. You're too valuable to throw your life away on things that don't matter. Don't be emotion-driven. Be spirit-led. Submit to God for his glory. Let this be your story. I will hunger for God. I will seek God. I will acknowledge God. I will humble myself before God. For God's word tells us in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you. A weak man becomes strong when he finds and fulfills God's purpose for his life. Remember our opening story about Apollo 13? It looked like the spaceship was doomed to death and disaster. The three men on board were likely going to die. But the story did not end with the failure of the parts on the aircraft. The engineers back in the control room wouldn't give up. They worked uh, feverishly with the astronauts to find a solution. The nation of America began to pray, and they found a way to rescue the men on board. At the last minute, when death and disaster seemed sure, the astronauts and the engineers at the control room worked together and brought the three astronauts back safely to Earth. Through courage and humility, they found a way of redemption and escape. And you can too. No matter how you've fallen, no matter how you've strayed, God has not lost sight of you and his purpose in your life. Turn to God. Call on him. For there is spiritual greatness in you. God can strengthen you and use you. For he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Are you facing a temptation you can't overcome? Are you facing a mountain you can't move? Are you facing a problem you can't solve? Romans 6.13 tells us what to do. Give yourselves completely to God since you've been given new life. Use your whole body as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. For when you do that, no matter how weak, you will become strong. You will fulfill God's purpose and find the path of peace. Father, I pray right now for everyone watching and listening. I ask you to move in our hearts and lives today. Deliver us, O oh God, from the inner flaws that would bring disaster. Lord, I know there are many watching and listening right now who have secret sins. Maybe nobody knows about a lust or a burning anger or a pride. But Father, I pray you shine your spotlight on those hidden flaws today. Remind us, O oh God, that you've created us for a purpose. Remind us, O oh God, that we can only be fulfilled when we find our purpose in you. Deliver us from being emotion driven and let us be spirit led. We come to you today and acknowledge you, O oh God, and give you the praise and the glory for everything that you have done for us. You've kept us and guided us and guarded us. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us forth and you're we give you praise right now and glory and honor. We know that you and you alone are God. We humble ourselves before you. We desire you. We seek you. Come and move in our lives. Come and open the windows of heaven and pour out your spirit upon us all, O oh God, that we might be pure and holy and live for you. Make a change in us. No matter where we've fallen, no matter what we've lost, bring us back as we yield to you, God. Raise us up and use us in this generation in this nation, in our community, in our church. Use us, O oh God, for your glory and honor. Let your purpose be fulfilled in us. We thank you and we praise you by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen.